Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Building Community Resilience Hubs, a conversation with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network and RISE Center. This webinar is presented by Clean Energy Group as a part of our Resilient Power Project. We have a number of excellent guest speakers with us today. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. You can call in via telephone or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled there. And you can also click on that to expand the webinar console. And one of the things that you might like to do with your webinar console is to submit questions and comments. We would love to hear from you. We're going to save about 15 minutes at the end of our presentation for a Q&A with the audience. And so do send in your questions and in your comments as you think of them. Don't wait until the very end and we'll get to as many as we can. Finally, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send you an email with a copy of the webinar recording and a PDF of the slides, probably this afternoon by tomorrow at the latest. And we'll also be posting those on our website at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. And that's a good web address to know because that's where we post all of our webinar, uh, past webinars and upcoming webinars. So lots of good stuff there. And with that, I'll pass it over now to Marielle Mango. Mari is the project director here at Clean Energy Group, and she will get us started. Great, thanks, Sam. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Before I introduce our presenters, I'm going to give just a quick introduction as to who we are at Clean Energy Group. CEG is a national nonprofit organization based in Vermont, working to advance innovation and clean energy technologies through policy, finance, and individual project level support. Our work is funded through support from a number of private organizations, many of which are shown here. We also have a sister organization, Clean Energy States Alliance, which is a membership coalition of organizations, primarily state agencies that manage clean energy funds. This presentation is brought to you by Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project. Um, the Resilient Power Project formed after Superstorm, Superstorm Sandy and the resulting outages that hit the Northeast. Since then, we've expanded our work and are currently active in project development across the country. The Resilient Power Project aims to improve access to resilient power technologies, primarily solar PV and battery storage, in low-income, BIPOC communities, and historically underserved communities. Our efforts include policy advocacy, project development support, and education, including publishing reports like those pictured on this slide. We work with state and federal policymakers to advance policies, incentives, and regulatory structures that enable greater access. We also author analyses and reports and host webinars like this one today. You can find all of these resources at our website, which is cleanegroup.org. This is the Resilient Power Project map, which we like to highlight. We work with local governments and community groups on an individual project level to ensure that solar and storage is being developed and implemented throughout the United States. We are not developers, but rather work as facilitators through this process. We've worked with senior centers, affordable housing providers, schools, municipalities. Some of the projects are highlighted here. Um, and we've worked on over 250 of solar and storage projects across the country, um, a number of which have been deployed, like the one seen here. We, you'll notice that many of the projects highlighted in this map are located on the east and the west coast, but we are increasingly supporting partners in the Midwest and Southeast as well. If you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to visit our website or to reach out directly. And with that, I will get to introducing our three panelists today. Um, I'll start with Ami Ravel. She's APEN's research director, where she works to advance climate resilience and environmental justice. Her experiences within the South Asian diaspora support her awareness of how environmental and workplace inequalities influence community health. She's applying her scientific background in public health to address the intersecting crises of a rapidly changing climate and growing economic inequality. We also have Sheena Robinson with us today. Sheena is a policy coordinator at APEN, where she supports community leaders to grow advocacy skills, ampl amplify their climate solutions, and pass policies for resistance and resilience in Oakland, Richmond, and statewide. Finally, Dan Riley is also joining us. Dan is the Director of Innovation at RISE Center. Since first joining RISE in 2009 as a video instructor, Dan has held many roles, 
For the past three years as the Director of Innovation, he has engaged youth and community envisioning and designing a new youth-driven, healing-centered space that can better serve the wants and needs of the diversity of the youth in Richmond. He is working to realize the vision of an expanded campus called Rise Commons so that Richmond youth and invested stakeholders have a space to build, learn, heal, love, and transform themselves in their communities. Thank you all for being with us today. And with that, I will hand it over to Ami. Great. Thank you, Marielle, for opening up. Um, and good morning and afternoon to folks who are joining us um, for this webinar. Um, we'll be sharing today um, APEN and RISE's work to build community resilience. Um, and we're really excited to share um, some of the emerging work, uh, both statewide and locally. So just to share today's agenda, um, I'll be opening up to frame um, the Resilience Before Disaster Report and some of the key concepts and terms and um, sort of just approaches that are outlined, um, as well as a little preview of some of the state policy work we're focused on now. Then I'll pass it over to Sheena to share uh, more about APEN's local implementation work. And then we'll have Dan um, close to and highlight our local case study of a Resilience Hub project at the RISE Youth Center in Richmond. Um, and then hopefully make time for Q&A and discussion. So just to give a little background on APEN, um, we're a grassroots space building organization. We organize working class Asian American and uh, immigrant and refugee communities, really around a multitude of environmental justice issues with the aim to achieve our mission um, and vision for healthy and thriving communities. We were formed after the first People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991 and have been doing community work for over 25 years. Um, a fundamental part of our work and vision is building community power and amplifying the voices of our members as decision makers for the programs and policies in their communities. So this looks like local organizing and leadership development, um, specifically with Southeast Asian refugees in Richmond who live on the fence line of the Chevron refinery, um, as well as Chinese immigrant communities in Oakland, Chinatown. And that's the, really the foundation of our work. We're also building political power through statewide coalitions and civic engagement, where we're doing targeted voter outreach with Asian American communities. Um, and finally, we do policy advocacy at the local and state levels through um, regulatory and legislative work uh, in California. So just to sort of um, really uh, set the tone in this current moment, we are seeing the way that California is being Push to extremes. And the record heat, fires, and pollution last year in particular all have one thing in common. They were made worse by climate change. And this convergence is the strongest signal yet that the climate crisis isn't far off from the future. It is here today and is, it is more intense than ever. Scientists say we've lost complete control and that there isn't really a normal anymore. And that when you add all these crises together, the impact is cumulative. But for environmental justice communities like those that APEN organizes um, that have been plagued with the burden of our polluting industries for generations, there is nothing new about cumulative health burdens. Um, however, traditional models of crisis response are proving deeply inadequate. They are coordinated through militarized entities like sheriff's departments, they rely upon protocols like evacuating to faraway sites. They might share alerts in one to two languages. And often, um, centers might require people to present ID to access services. So these types of policies are examples of the way our communities are being collectively shut out um, from the support that they need. And so this, um, leads to our push in this current moment to demand for a just recovery. The time has come to make long-term deep investments in the resilience of communities that have the least material resources. These commitments take leadership. We know that with tight budgets and poor fiscal forecasts, there will be pressure to revert to austerity, to cut public expenditures and worsen the conditions that have already weakened the social safety net. 
And instead, uh, when we push for a just recovery, we are saying the state has to actually do the exact opposite, recover through ambitious investments in communities, public services, and high road jobs to repair the historic legacy of economic, public health, environmental, and racial injustice. So this leads me to just wanting to paint a big picture vision of what is a resilient community? What, is, uh, what, what do resilient communities, that is those that can respond to crisis, that are meaningly engaged and empowered, that don't Threat, uh, don't face threats from displacement and live in cohesion look like. And I think this image on the left gives us one example of sort of what um, that vision is. Part of that is that we wanna see solar and storage and microgrids providing resilient energy. We wanna see green sprays to protect fr folks from extreme heat and flooding. We want folks to have access to transit to be able to evacuate. Um, access to cooling and clean air centers. And if you see on the bottom right, we want to see sup neighbors supporting each other um, and coming together in cohesion. And those are just a few examples. But I also want to point folks to the image on the right and say that to achieve this vision, we have to do more than just strengthen built infrastructure and the natural environment. While those are critical to building resilience, we must also prioritize communities particularly those that are most impacted, namely working class communities of color in the face of climate change. And so our vision really centers um, neighborhoods and preparing people to cope with and respond to climate disasters. And finally, I wanna name, just to link the role of community resilience in a just recovery. Through historic disinvestment and deep systemic failures, our communities have had to be incredibly resilient, and now they are organizing for change and innovating local models for crisis response. In some places, neighbors have formed mutual aid networks to share their resources. Schools are providing food for families, or public libraries are turning into cooling and air respite centers. So these are just a few examples of what uh, the ways our communities are organizing for change and sort of building our own resilience in the face of crisis. And so this context, I think, um, really forms the foundation of some of the, the elements that we highlight in APEN's Resilience Before Disaster Report that we jointly released with our partners, SCIU California in 2015, as well as the Blue Green Alliance. Um, and this report really makes the case for investing in social infrastructure as part of advancing climate adaptation resilience. It highlights two community-driven policy models that can be scaled at the state level. One, our community resilience hubs, and two, in-home resilience. And so just to highlight um, what we mean when we say social infrastructure, um, we're describing the services and facilities that secure the economic, health, cultural and social well-being of the community. And so this means things like um, public institutions, uh, community organizations like places of worship, um, youth centers and senior centers, community facilities. Um, it means schools, health clinics, really all of the different um, community institutions, um, businesses, public um, institutions and orgs that make up the social fabric of the community. And so this is where, um, just to highlight the uh, approach to community resilience hubs that we're going to be sharing more about today, community resilience hubs are spaces where communities gather, organize, and access social services, not only during disaster response and recovery, but on a daily basis, these are places where people, where communities health, economic and social needs are met. And so that can include um, resources and services like access to cooling and heating, um, consistent electricity access, food, water, medical supplies, um, information and communications access, and partner coordination with different stakeholders. Um, and in the report, we highlight 
sort of a range of principles that resilience hubs um, really must embody. Um, resilience hubs should leverage established and trusted community and public facilities. They foster community governance um, and collaboration. They integrate workforce development strategies to create high road jobs, and they should be targeting benefits to the communities most impacted. So again, that's just a big picture overview of um, the framing. The last thing I'll hi highlight in this opening is that from all of this work of learning and, and, and um, sort of just making meaning of the moment through our research and report and uplifting the organizing and lived experiences that um, we witnessed last year with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, from this report and uh, sort of uh, policy framing, we are actually moving into not just publishing a report, but pushing policy that embodies and really practices these values. So just wanted to highlight for folks that might be interested in what this looks like, at least at the state policy level, um, we're pushing a bill right now to really resource and scale resilience hubs through the creation of a new grant program that would really um, enable whole building resilience upgrades um, like energy efficiency, like microgrids, like ventilation and, um, and sort of cooling upgrades to, um, to really ta target it at those trusted places that I described, investing in the social infrastructure, whether that be um, critical uh, community institutions or affordable housing where our, um, our communities live or access services. So I'm not gonna go too de uh, deeply now, but if folks have questions, I can answer a little later. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Sheena now to share more about our local implementation work. Yeah, thanks, Ami. Um, so as we mentioned, in terms of APEN's core strategies, kind of at the intersection of our organizing and our policy work, um, we have um, been able to pass some um, really impactful state policies. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit more about the, the policy that we were able to pass. And it's also our kind of flagship policy in terms of sticking through it all the way through implementation and all the lessons that are coming with that as we try to add resilience um, in addition to clean energy that's actually reaching um, our communities and environmental justice communities around the state. Um, so uh, the, the program is the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing or SOMA program, um, which was created by a bill passed in, in 2015 and is a um, billion dollars over 10 years um, for solar on affordable housing, on multifamily affordable housing, um, which is the largest investment um, for solar for renters in the country. Um, another key uh, part of this program is that the majority of benefits actually have to go to the tenants in terms of bill saving. Um, and there's also workforce and um, resident outreach requirements. Um, and so this was a big step forward in, in making um, clean energy um, that's, you know, it, it's a strong market in California, but actually helping reach um, the communities where the pollution burden um, and the, you know, the energy bill burden is highest. Um, and this is a picture of a, a screenshot of a great video um, that explains the program in more depth um, that's on our website at apenforej.org slash SOMA. Um, so we continue to be involved in the implementation of the program as a team of um, community-based majority environmental justice um, organizations um, to ensure equity in the rollout, ensure uh, geographic diversity of the projects um, and actually help our community members access both the solar um, for their housing and the green job skills associated. Um, so far, almost all of the projects are giving upwards of 90% of the bill savings to tenants, which is relieving a huge burden um, or will relieve a, a huge burden of the energy bills for the working class seniors and families that live there. Um, obviously COVID kind of slowed down um, the installation and interconnection process. So, 
um, we're hoping to see a lot of those actually happen this year and be able to follow up with the tenants in those buildings. Um, so our partnering in implementation wasn't mandated as part of the bill, but it's made such a big difference um, to have a nonprofit team be the statewide administrator, which kind of allowed the values of community engagement to be built into this and led to this contract of us being um, able to have resources um, to support the outreach, education, and engagement. Um, while deepening our own energy expertise from really being part of this program from the regulatory space, um, shaping COVID response and everything else that's come up since um, its creation. Um, and so this has um, also been really helpful for our, our partners on, in terms of the statewide administrators um, they now have a more sustained and ongoing pathway to keep incorporating community experiences, lived experiences. And I want to lift that up as really important in terms of how strong the SOMA program um, uh, can be and how adaptive it can be, um, because this hasn't always been the case, um, you know, working or applying for state energy programs um, when the the, the view is kind of looking at um, community-based organizations or the community where a project is cited as kind of a, a box to check off in terms of just informing um, or being the last to know about this, um, you know, rather than a relationship that can be fruitful both ways. And I want to lift this up um, both at that kind of two-way pathway for, in, uh, for community engagement, as well as the opportunity and the lessons around resilience. So recently it was ruled that another program, um, the Self-Generation Incentive Program, or SCHIP, can be paired with SOMA to offer solar plus storage on these um, affordable housing sites. But there's some big technical things to figure out. There's issues with eligibility in terms of, um, you know, uh, between the two programs in terms of the types of buildings, um, technically, which I'll get to in a, in a second, and geographically, um, and kind of misaligned administrators with SSHIP being run by um, the investor-owned utilities and, and not a particularly transparent application process. Um, but all in all, SOMA wasn't actually designed to power um, the buildings where the, the PV systems are on. They're designed to kind of export that power to the grid to provide those bill savings and economic benefits. Um, and although, as I mentioned, you know, the vast majority, you know, 90% of those benefits are going to tenants. Um, the, you know, the design around the allocations, they happen at the beginning and um, folks are still trying to work out this kind of complex world of multifamily, apartment building solar, and how to make it more flexible because those resilience demands are also high. Um, so I think that's our, our big lesson from this, that we actually do need um, uh, solar and uh, storage systems that are designed for flexibility and, um, adaptive to needs in areas where the grid will go increasingly go down, um, where people need to shelter in place. Um, and that by doing that on multifamily housing can offer resilience um, and that kind of safe shelter in place to a lot of people. Um, and renters, you know, are primarily um, uh, you know, lower income, primarily communities of color, families of color that are living in apartments across California, um, especially, and um, and we're all sheltering in place now, or most of us, but many fence line communities have to shelter in place at a moment's notice um, due to industrial accidents and disasters. So being able to provide resilience at home um, is really important in terms of getting California resilient. Um, and so that's one of the reasons um, we're calling an AB 1087, which Ami just talked about, is making sure the state actually coordinates, um, you know, between agencies, between the programs that do exist already as this strong foundation 
uh, but really think about that um, coordination and streamlining in terms of eligibility, accessibility, and implementation. Um, next slide, please. And then lastly, I'll lift up um, another bill that we worked on a few years ago, SB 160, um, Cultural Competency and Community Engagement in Emergency Preparedness. Um, and also encouraged um, offices and emergency services to coordinate with agencies like public health and entities more embedded in hard to reach um, communities and um, you know, not in sheriff's offices um, where they currently are. And this came about because we've seen non-English speaking communities, seniors, those with chronic health issues, visual or hearing impairments, you know, left behind or um, an afterthought during wildfire evacuations, refinery explosions, um, you know, not have access to information for extreme heat warnings, water uh, contamination, or even in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, a lot of our communities were not getting information about what was happening. So there's a huge area of growth in terms of disseminating emergency preparedness information to folks that are on the margins as well as incorporating their lived experiences, needs, um, expertises, and vision in disaster planning. And so Dan's gonna speak to the community governance model at the Resilience Hub that we're supporting, but um, you know, already talking with community members and youth, folks do have a vision for what a safe, inclusive, accessible, helpful place looks like in emergency and how they would wanna get there. Um, so really seeing this, uh, these kind of principles of community engagement as really core to the success of any resilience policy, any um, implementation of resilience policy and then building of hubs. Um, and again, the role of trusted messengers and institutions is really important as well. And as I mentioned, the most county office of emergency services are held within the sheriff's office and they are, you know, given budgets under public safety next to police, the judicial branch, courts, um, and some federal grants for climate emergencies are also under the Department of Homeland Security with militarized and often racist requirements. So. For communities of color, um, you know, no wonder folks are being left out of um, the climate and emergency preparedness process. Um, but there are other models, like the Promotora model of community lay health workers that are, you know, community members themselves that are then trained and um, given public health training and deep knowledge of support programs and services. Um, and this could be expanded to include, um, you know, climate exacerbated. Um, other social determinants of health or other emergency preparedness. So we saw um, SB 160 as one path to move away from, uh, you know, a more forced uh, like law enforcement based response to disasters and emergencies of all kinds and allow for more community visioning, participation, decision making, um, and really kind of help lead to that creation of resilient, um, resilient hubs and resilient communities. Um, so those are just two examples of some some policies that we're working on shaping um, that contribute to kind of the landscape in which we're building resilience hubs with that um, deeply rooted vision. And from that, I'll pass it over to Dan to provide a really concrete and amazing example. Great, thank you, Sheena. Um, so good morning and good afternoon, everyone joining us. Uh, I'd like to start by sharing just a little bit about uh, RISE, the RISE Center. So RISE is a youth serving organization. We're located in Richmond, California. We serve uh, young folks, primarily young folks of color between the ages of 13 and 21. Uh, in Richmond and throughout uh, West Contra Costa County here in the Bay Area. So um, our doors opened, the doors of the Rice Center opened in 2008, uh, although the work to get to that point started a, a number of years before that. So the, the legacy of Rise is really a legacy of youth organizing. 
uh, in the early 2000s, uh, it was actually young folks of color that were responding to community conditions and a lack of investment by adult stakeholders who came together to identify uh, what they needed for themselves and for their families uh, in, in their community. And from that uh, you know, work that spanned a number of years, uh, eventually the doors of RISE were open in 2008. And I do wanna just take a moment to note that a lot of the young folks that uh, worked um, organizing in those years, they knew that they would never directly benefit from the work that they're putting in, that by the time RISE or something like RISE was established, that they would be older. And so it's really the beginning of a legacy of young folks um, organizing and building things that are larger than them, um, that they were doing for their, their younger brothers and sisters and cousins. Um, and that's a, a legacy that, that we hold um, dear that I think is really important as we talk about kind of the, the future and we're gonna to move to Rise Commons in a second, but that's sort of the foundation um, of, of Rise um, and one that I know resonates really well with APEN, which is why our partnership in, in this project is so strong. So um, with that said, Rise Commons is the most current endeavor of ours. Uh, we are expanding from a 6,600 square foot building uh, to a 45,000 square foot campus uh, that includes three buildings and, and site work. So uh, we are currently uh, in construction. Uh, the image that you're looking at here, the two uh, kind of green buildings in the foreground and the site work uh, are the two sites that are the two buildings in the site that are currently under construction. Um, and then the purple uh, images, one is a, a third building that we own that will be the site of a future health clinic uh, and then an empty lot that is open for future development. So uh, altogether, it's a 45,000 square foot campus. Uh, we currently serve youth ages 13 to 21 with the opening of Rise Commons. Uh, that will expand uh, to 11 to 24 with different age appropriate programs and services kind of focused on those different age groups. Um, the work that RISE does, we are a direct service organization, but we also work uh, towards systems change. So kind of the, the whole um, continuum. Um, we do serve young folks and offer programs in the areas of media arts and culture. Uh, education and career supports, kind of clinical and non-clinical community health services, uh, and and youth leadership and organizing uh, uh, and civic engagement development. Um, and we do offer direct services, but we are active as change agents um, and do engage in advocacy and policy work as well. So um, all of that I think is important because it starts, it really speaks to um, what was being shared earlier regarding as we think about resilience hubs, it's really critical that um, relationships are built um, prior to, to times of crisis. And so all of this work uh, is the foundation of how RISE and RISE in partnership with other organizations such as APEN kind of build those relationships. So, um, and then I'll also note quickly before moving on that RISE Commons um, young folks were critical to the design of Rise Commons. Uh, it's been a process that's been going for about three years now um, from the, well, really 20 years as I was sharing earlier, but uh, kind of formally the last three years. Um, and young folks uh, came together and really visioned and dreamed like what they wanted to see in their community for themselves and for their families. And uh, we worked with uh, about 200 young folks, some of whom were highly engaged with RISE and would show up here every day. And some young folks that had never even heard of RISE, but were high school students or middle school students in the community. And through a series of interviews and design shreds and focus groups and uh, art projects and uh, any number of other ways that we engaged young folks, um, they kind of laid out the vision for, for what we are looking at here. Uh, we did um, engage with an architect firm that did a great, amazing job converting those visions into a built environment, uh, but there should be no mistake about whose vision is being built. It really is young folks and specifically young folks of color. 
Um, and that's carried over to our partnership with APEN as far as uh, engaging young folks in really deep, meaningful, authentic, genuine, non-tokenizing ways, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, but the last point on this slide is just our, I think, a, a deep-seated belief held by both organizations that if uh, something is going to be uh, for the community, it has to be co-designed uh, with the with the community and that's something that um, laid the foundation for rise commons and is laying the foundation for um, the resiliency work related to the build um, that we're doing with apen so uh next slide thank you oh that was great timing um so real quick i want to focus a little bit more on um what it means to build relationships um prior to kind of moments of, of emergency because it really is it really is critical. So um, relationships that are grounded in, in health and healing and safety outside of moments of crisis are are absolutely necessary. Um, we, you know, we talked a lot with APEN early on about, you know, how is this hub going to be used? Will it be used in order for it to be seen and viewed as accessible uh, uh, for the community? Um, those relationships have to have to be built and they have to be built upon a foundation of safety. So as we think of safety, um, we, we think of physical, we think of emotional, and we think of political. So physical safety, when, when young folks, when their families uh, come to rise, um, you know, do they feel physically safe? Do they feel like um, it's a place where they can decompress, they can relax, um, where they can be themselves? Um, you know, is it a safe space within the community as a whole? Is, is this a sanctuary space for them and, and for their peers? Um, and, you know, do they feel safe kind of day to day when they show up here? Uh, and are they going to feel safe in times of crisis? Is this a place where they're going to want to go uh, to be uh, in, a time, in a time of crisis? And what services um, does the, the, the building actually provide, uh, what kind of supports can the resilient hub, resiliency hub, uh, provide in times of crisis? So those have to do, I think, with physical safety, e emotional safety. Um, is, is this for, does it feel like a place that is for them and for their families, um, specifically young folks of color and their families, uh, you know, communities that are, uh, families that are, um, you know, speak different languages that have different experiences. So is this a place that is for them and their families? Is it welcoming? Is it healing? Is it healing space? Is it responsive and adaptive to their needs? The needs of young folks in our community today are not the same as they were five years ago or 10 years ago. So is it a, a community hub that is responsive and adaptive to the ever growing and changing needs of the community? And does it reflect their priorities, I think, are, are are key issues for us to always be considering. And then political, um, you know, do they have an impact on the space, on the operation of the space? Is it connected to something larger than than just themselves? Um, are there genuine, again, non-tokenizing leadership opportunities? These are the types of questions um, that I think we are always asking and engaging young folks and community members around. Um, to, to hear from them. And we're building partnerships and programs that are kind of grounded in, in these, these different um, notions of, of safety. Uh, again, when crisis uh, comes, uh, we want RISE, we, we need, if it's going to function as a resilience hub, we need RISE Commons to actually be a place um, where relationships are, are already built. Um, and so these are some of the ways that, that we think about um, Think about building those relationships. And we can go to the next slide. So Rise Commons as a community resilience hub. So a little bit of a timeline. Um, you can see these photos are from a couple weeks ago. Um, we brought some of our staff and 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 young folks uh, to do some site visits. Uh, so this is pretty close to the current state of construction. Um, it started off, this project really started off as we, we had this project specifically with APEN really started off as um, we, we, we thought we wanted solar on the building. And, you know, I will, I will offer a caveat. RISE is very um, kind of politically and value aligned. 
but we do not work primarily in the space of just transition uh, or, or even environmental justice. I mean, there are, there are clearly uh, areas where our politics um, and our values align with with that work. But, um, you know, I wouldn't say that we had going into this the most expansive vision of what we were trying to accomplish, but that's where the partnership with APEN has been so critical. So with that said, you know, I think for us, it started off as um, we, we thought we wanted solar um, in working with APEN. Oh, solar and storage, what is that? Like, is that an opportunity? What opportunities would that open up, say, for youth governance of, you know, the funds that we might save by having a system like that? Um, you know, how could we build out some really meaningful youth development um, components attached to this? But it did start off as kind of an idea to do solar or solar plus storage, possibly. Uh, with, with youth engagement and leadership um, kind of right there. Like if we were gonna do this, how would they be involved? Uh, an early idea that we came up with that we are still at this point moving forward with, if there are cost savings to the organization, how could we pool that money into a fund that then is youth directed so that young folks and advisory board could actually redirect those funds annually along with our, our annual budgeting process uh, into the programs or projects or sub grants or um, policy work that that they uh, that they want to direct those funds to. Um, so you know that is that is one idea that is out there. And then also as we moved a little bit farther along, thinking about critical loads, what are they? What you know what is critical in times of crisis? Really like hearing from young folks, like what is important to them, and making sure that we are incorporating that into. Are thinking about you know developing out the um, developing out the resilience hub. Um, the partnership kind of expanded uh, naturally. Uh, it expanded into joint fundraising, uh, kind of learning together. Um, you know, be, do, doing things such as this to to provide an example, kind of in in the realm of uh, you know policy advocacy and and field building work. How could Rise and APEN partner to, to do some of that field building work and policy work when, when it makes sense. Um, and then I think the visioning, as a, as a result of that, the visioning expanded. And I think uh, we are no longer just thinking about solar plus, um, plus storage. You know, we are now thinking about um, you know, air, uh, air quality conditions and, and other types of emergencies. So, um, you know, power outages are, are unfortunately uh, common in this particular area, uh, both from failing infrastructure in our particular part of Richmond, Rise has uh, seen a number of power outages just generally over the years, um, but also rolling blackouts. Um, and so kind of we are deeply considering, and, and I'm not considering we're doing it, a solar and storage system. Uh, but also extreme weather conditions. So as alluded to earlier, and I'm sure many folks had seen the images from the Bay Area over the summer with the heat and the fire season, the smoke, the air quality being so poor. Um, you know, we are thinking about air filtration and, and rise commons as, as a cooling center. That is an expanded vision. That was not on our radar at the very beginning. That is a result of the natural organic development of our partnership. Um, and really expanding our own and listening to young folks and and expanding our own thinking of what a resilience hub uh, needs to be in this community. And then also other emergencies in California earthquakes and also now uh, kind of new on our list for many of us uh, pandemic um, and really uh, how are we thinking through like uh, information, communication, resource sharing in, in those other types of um, situations. So um you know our vision has expanded through through this partnership and in partnership with young folks and, and kind of following their leadership um and then i'll end here because uh, i want to leave time for questions but moving towards the opening and, and, and a phased approach so just to kind of give folks the end with some logistics um rise is current rise center or sorry rise commons is currently looking to open uh in some Form, obviously impacted by the coronavirus um, and, and doing so safely. But the campus being complete in June, July of this year, uh, with August and September starting to move staff uh, and, and programming um, back into the space in some limited capacity. Uh, and then or October, November, starting to engage some, some youth cohorts in person and then really looking January 
to March of 2022 to kind of fully reopen, driven at that point primarily by response to um, safety uh, coming, coming um, reopening in the pandemic, not necessarily kind of a, the technical of having the building ready to go. The building will be, I think, ready um, before, um, before the, the world around us is uh, in some ways. Um, and then solar specifically, which is the first component, um, I think we're, we're, we're shooting for um, kind of late 2021. Uh, we may not have the entire system built uh, in the day that the doors open, but it is, it is aligning closely, so that is moving. And as far as the additional components uh, around air filtration and, and some of the other, you know, uh, really uh, analyzing our, our communications infrastructure, um, you know, we're looking at, at continuing to uh, build upon what we see as the foundation of a resilience hub, um, which is Rise Commons in, in the building. So um, those will continue to be explored with young folks and in partnership with APEN and roll out over time. So it's a little bit of the, uh, the timeline. Um, I'll, I'll end it there. I want to make sure we have time for questions. So, so thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was a really um, informative overview of everyone's projects. We have quite a few questions that came in, but I would encourage everyone, if you have more questions, to please put them in the, the question box. We should be able to get through quite a few today. Um, I'm gonna start with a lot of the questions were focused on this realization of people not knowing that solar does not provide resilience on its own and that you actually need battery storage to do that. Um, from any of our presenters today, could you dive in a little bit into how, um, in, in, in working with your communities, did you come across folks that were unaware that solar didn't provide resilience on their own? And if so, how did you come at that learning curve and include the community in understanding kind of what resilience is and the technologies that were, that were necessary? I can take a stab at that. Um, I mean, I, I will be honest, I did not know that. I mean, that that is why it is so critical for us to partner with an organization like APEN, um, who kind of works in this realm. There, there is a huge learning curve on, on our end. Um, and so I, I think there is a lot of education in a project like this that is necessary. Um, I don't know if uh, Sheena wants to speak to this, um, but I know uh, APEN has done an amazing job of engaging young folks and so much of what we talk about is is education so there's a whole component to this um to this project which is really youth programming um kind of day-to-day -day work and so uh, they they have gone through a series of workshops uh educational workshops uh to learn about this um, i've seen a bunch of memes that were created for them to share with their peers i mean just really creative ways for uh, for that APEN is employing to um, uh, to engage young folks in in that education process to uh, train them into leadership roles where they will be kind of the communicators of that uh, information um, uh, to the community uh, the broader community their families um, and as uh, Rise looks to expand upon some of that work. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna lean heavily, I think, on the models that APEN has created uh, in this process to um, to kind of model our own continued education with young folks and, and their families with with our own members. So, yeah, and I can just add on to that a little bit. Um, it also involves, you know, like APEN growing our own expertise. Like we started um, uh, our policy work um, in the late 2000s with our first um, Solar for All bill in like 2011. And since then have been slowly growing our own expertise as staff um, and really trying to be that liaison um, and then get to the point where Dan said that we're, um, you know, we're sharing all the information that we're learning with our community members. And then the goal is for them to have the expertise themselves um, and then make it more accessible and spread it further. Um, so I will say it's definitely a process. Um, we don't have anyone on staff that is 
uh, you know, that has like an engineering background or comes from that background. Um, and I think it's part of that process of us, uh, you know, committing to understanding that these are tools and resources that our communities deserve and that it's part of the path forward away from um, the incredibly extractive and polluted um, economy that we live in now. Um, and just a matter of putting in that work and being able to translate and kind of asserting ourselves in policy and regulatory spaces to be able to be that liaison um, and start, you know, disseminating that information and growing our expertise across staff and members. Great, thank you. Um, another question for the folks at APEN, how would you advise local governments in selecting and developing long-term community partners um, when they're trying to develop a, a resilience hub in a neighborhood? What does that process look like? Um, yeah, I can start and others feel free to jump in. Um, I think based off of our, um, you know, our growing experience implementing um, SOMA, it has been very impactful to, um, you know, we, we are a community-based organization, but being able to work with others. Um, so I think it's important to think about not just partnering with one community-based organization. Um, for example, you know, APEN works very specifically with Asian American immigrant and refugee communities. However, that's not to say our neighborhoods are that exclusive. You know, they also have um, different communities, different languages, different needs. And so by having kind of um, a CBO implementing team um, that we have with SOMA, we're able to collaborate with each other, um, you know, lean on each other, um, learn from each other, as well as you know, have that kind of coordinated um, relationship with the with a program administrator. And, you know, I would say depending on your area, but probably very true for any any place um, in California that there are actually very many diverse communities within any jurisdiction, um, you know, around any kind of project siting. And so it does require um, you know, probably a couple partnerships with community-based organizations. And if those are not, um, you know, what's in your area, it could be a, you know, a faith-based, uh, you know, advocacy group, other kinds of direct services. Um, you know, we leave that kind of open to, to what's available, but who's really connected to kind of hard to reach communities, who already has those relationships and that just makes the resources and the funding, you know, that much more efficient and streamlined to be able to connect directly. Great, thank you. And and I think this question is open to everyone, but a lot of folks had questions regarding how you fund these types of projects, whether it's for the pre-development piece or for actually getting the, the project off the ground. How did you go about raising funds and where did you look for resiliency hubs? I'm happy to start and just share, um, you know, it really is a diversity and suite of uh, funding uh, possibilities we're exploring. And that's, I think, another really um, exciting part of APEN's partnership with the RISE Center is that we're really um, having prioritized and really deeply looking to invest and see the RISE project through. We are getting creative about how to resource um, the project. And so um, I think just to share, you know, we've looked at philanthropy and leveraging, um, you know, foundation grants to be able to, le to leverage and um, fund sort of, sort of the organizing elements uh, in terms of staffing and meetings, as well as um, infrastructure. Um, and I think that is something more aligned with, uh, as a nonprofit, um, the sort of universe of, of grant making and relationships we have. I think a newer edge that I would also I offer that I think Sheena and I have been really like learning a lot about is sort of 
state funding opportunities. Um, SOMA, for example, and SGIP, which are two programs we named, are funded, those state programs are funded through, um, you know, different pots. SOMA through uh, is sort of the revenue from our cap and trade that comes through um, uh, our utilities and um, it's generate will generate a billion dollars over 10 years of the program. Um, SGIP is sort of another utilities ratepayer set of funding. Um, but we, we really have to push for uh, more resources, which is why we're, we're excited about the bill this year, to leverage additional funding from the state um, for investments in our communities. Great, thank you. Um, in, in terms of SOMA, the SOMA program, can you speak a little bit more as to your experience with that and um, who you worked with? Is there like specific developers that are working with SOMA and barriers or um, lessons learned in terms of trying to incorporate battery storage into a SOMA project or a community solar project? Yeah, um, so just to name who are some of the the players, and there is, um. Uh, I think calsoma.org is the website with, um, you know, the partners and the handbook and more information for both, um, for, for all property owners, tenants, and developers. Um, but we um, supported the, the creation of kind of a, a nonprofit or a statewide program administrator, which consists of grid alternatives, Association for Energy Affordability, Center for Sustainable Energy, and I'm forgetting the fourth one, but <laughs> it's a whole partnership. Um, and then um, as the statewide administrator, they partner with um, CBOs across the state. And a number of us are also members of the California Environmental Justice um, Alliance. Um, Though we are adding some new members um, to represent um, the Central Valley to make sure that all all regions kind of have a voice in how we're thinking about community outreach and education, um, I will say SOMA did have kind of a, a first come first serve um, application basis, which we know isn't the most equitable form, especially when we're trying to make sure that there's proportional representation for disadvantaged communities across the state, which are, you know, at least 25% of the population. So wanting to see, um, you know, developers take on projects in those areas. And so that's something kind of what we're advocating for as a CPO team um, to be able to increase that kind of representation, increase um, opportunities for um, smaller contractors, smaller property owners to kind of get a foot in the door um, because it was, uh, people were really excited. It's a ton of resources, like you said, a billion dollars over 10 years. And so the first day that applications were open, you know, there was a wait list because it was so um, filled up. And so we're trying to work back now to make sure that there's, um, you know, a little bit more equity and not just so top down, like whoever has the resources and the knowledge and was ready to go off the bat um, and then actually think about the need of where these projects need to be. Yeah, and this is Ami. I would just add that we similarly saw that that sort of a, a quick wait list and a, a program getting oversubscribed with the the battery storage program SGIP that we we actually tried to apply for in order to um, access the incentive and funding for the Rise project, but we ended up on the wait list. I think which just names the need for not just more funding but also making sure that uh, communities that um, have the least resources are actually able to effectively apply and um, access the funding and, uh, and navigate the application. Great, thank you. And I think that this is gonna have to be our last question because we're um, closing out here, but Dan, we got quite a few questions regarding how you selected what the critical loads would be at the RISE Center. Was there any sort of um, community engagement in, in terms of that, of how you select what would be powered in the event of an outage? And were there any public health considerations like 
outlet stations for folks that have medical equipment or refrigeration for medication, th medication, things like that. Yeah, so we um, we engage with young folks. We did a whole series of of workshops, really asking them what you know what would you need in different scenarios. So um, kind of uh, building on our roots as youth youth organ serving organizations, um, we created different scenarios uh, and and um, kind of had young folks with post-it notes go around and talk and put up ideas and distilled that information down. So we did work with the community and ran different scenarios, some of the ones that we could expect here in, in California. Uh, and we are in the process of working with the, uh, the construction team uh, and, and the engineers on the project um, to, to actually convert some of those desires into um, you know, what needs to happen in the infrastructure of the building itself around critical loads. I will say some of the things that were elevated, communication for our young folks is really critical. For young folks that don't have regular access to uh, cell phones that, that have plans, um, Wi-Fi is absolutely critical in order to um, you know, continue to communicate with, with their families in times of crisis. So uh, Wi-Fi communication infrastructure was elevated. Um, uh, refrigeration for medicines was definitely elevated. Um, actually, uh, something that uh, stood out to me was um, that came directly from young folks was um, entertainment um, and heard a lot about uh, if, if it's boring, then they're out. Right, and that's that's very real. So if there is a, a, an environmental emergency and and safety is within this building, uh, we need young folks to be there. And part of what um, they told us was then there has to be entertainment in the building um, in order to to keep us there. So that's something very real that we heard that was not on my radar. So um, in in engaging with young folks through a series of kind of activities. Um, we identified kind of wish lists of things, um, and I am in the process of working with the construction team, the engineers, to figure out um, exactly what that looks like, uh, you know, as far as like a panel goes and stuff like that, um, to actually make those critical loads real. But that, that, was, that was the basic process. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I think with that, we will close out our webinar for today. I would like to thank all of our presenters for joining us. This was really great. We had a lot of great questions. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is, is on this page. And then the last thing I'd want to mention is we do have some upcoming webinars, Connected Solutions, How a New Program Improves the Economics and Social Benefits of Solar and Storage in Massachusetts and Beyond, and that will be this month on the 12th. And then on the 23rd, we have collaborating with community-based organizations and energy justice primer for states. Thanks to our presenters and to everyone for joining today.